الحمد لله نحمده سبحانه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا وعظيمنا وزعيمنا وحبيبنا وقائدنا محمدا صلى الله عليه وسلم قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وآمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نطمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم آمين أما بعد We are continuing to cover the issue of Islam and governance and today we are going to talk about the principles of governance in Islam and the system of governance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in the Quran that our matters ought to be decided in a certain way. Our public matters, matters of public interest, ought to be decided in a certain way. This way is called Ashura wa amruhum shura baynahum. Their matter ought to be decided based on consultation. Consultation means involving at least people who have experience, knowledge, and wisdom in handling the specific matter. So in matters, for example, of public health, then public health experts ought to be consulted. In matters of defense, people of the military ought to be consulted. In matters of propagation of Islam and means and ways to send and reach out with the message to the maximum number of audience, people in the media who have the experience ought to be consulted. To understand the importance of this principle of governance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings us this issue in two places. One in Surah al-Shura, which is a general statement. وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورَ بَيْنَهُمْ This is not only in politics. This is also applicable for family, for organizations, for small institutions, for communities, as much as it is also applicable for nations and states. So this principle applies to any group activity that would affect the rest of the group. One of the things we need to notice is the fact that the Prophet Wasallam, and I want you to pay attention to this statement, the Prophet Wasallam never decided a public matter, never decided a public matter without consultation if it affects the community, whether in limb, blood, or treasure. Anything that he decides on behalf of the community that will cause the community money or harm, then he goes to consult the community. Which means he can decide issues that wouldn't affect the community, right? Without consulting the community, but if it will cause the community anything, then he has to consult the community. Whether it is the cost is gonna be money or blood or limb or anything like that. The other position where the Quran brings the issue of consultation is in Surah uh, Al Imran in the commentary of the Quran on the Battle of Uhud. 
The Battle of Uhud was a battle where the Muslims knew that there is an attack, a pending attack coming from Quraysh. And they were discussing whether to stay in Medina and let them come close so that they can take defense in the infrastructure of Medina or to go out of Medina so that the families and the women and the children are not going to be horrified by what may happen. And the discussion went on. The Prophet ﷺ was of the opinion that entrenching in Medina is better than going out to Mount Uhud. But some of the zealot youth of the companion said, no, no, we're up to them. We're going to finish them. Don't worry about it. Let's go out. And they were so insistent that the Prophet ﷺ went down on their opinion. He followed their opinion. So as soon as he went to his tent and he put on the helmet and the shield and he came out with a grim outlook on him, that was obvious to everybody, those young men looked back and said, maybe we forced the Prophet to do something that he would rather not do. Let us talk back to him. So they went to him and they said, Prophet Muhammad, we're sorry. We think we should have gone with your opinion, not our own, but you know, he said, we can't. He said, it is not befitting for a Prophet. As soon as he put his helmet, and his shield, which a declaration of war, that he would take them out before Allah has decided the matter between him and his enemies. It's not fitting for a prophet to retreat or show a sign of retreat. So they went. And we all know, I believe, the story after that. Uh, some of uh, the companions who were assigned to protect the upper sides of the mountain, uh, they looked at the bodies being collected and the enemy being defeated, and they said, you know what? We can get down and get our share before the battle is over. The Prophet's instruction وسلم, was, do not leave your position on top of this mountain, even if you see us snatched by wolves and dogs. Don't move. But they did. So the result was one of the most serious defeat, defeats of the Muslims and it hurt them. 70 of the most courageous and strongest companions were killed. And that's a huge number, considering the size of the community. And the Prophet ﷺ himself got hurt. His jaw was broken. His heel was bleeding. And many of the companions fell, whether injured or killed, in the battlefield. The enemies only left after they looked at Mus'ab ibn Umayr when he was killed, radiallahu anhu arda, and he looked very much like the Prophet ﷺ. They thought that they killed the Prophet ﷺ, and they said, we killed Muhammad, let's go. On the heels of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet ﷺ, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ It is because of a mercy that Allah has bestowed upon you that you were lenient, flexible, and easy with them. وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْفَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ If you were harsh, if you were stiff, they would have dispersed and left you alone. فَعْفُ عَنْهُمْ Forgive them. وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ Ask Allah to forgive them. وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ And consult them in the matter. Well, it is consultation that he used. 
But this is exactly the opposite of what people do today. When an army gets defeated, the leaders tend to fire the generals and fire this and fire this. But Allah is telling him, consult them. He's not telling him, blame them or punish them. Consult them and apply the mercy we gave you as you did. You were lenient, you were easy, continue. So this is the second position where the Quran says, Shura is still the way to go forward. Shura is consultation, to consult with the community. And that is an entrenched position that Muslim scholars have agreed almost unanimously that it is the way to manage any public affairs, whether it is a small family, a large family, a clan, a, a, a community issue or community organization, everything that matters to the community has to be decided based on consultation. What does consultation offer? Consultation offers a span of diverse opinions on the same issue coming from people with varieties of backgrounds, which means each one is looking for an aspect either to protect a specific interest or to look for attaining a specific interest or protect against harm or potential harm. So with the multitudes of opinions, it is like currency. The good currency kicks out the bad currency of the market. Good opinions float on the top and those others fall down and sink. So the consultation is a process of filtering the opinions. When we fail to consult with our families on matters that affect members in the family, we fail in our leadership of the family. Why? Because we are violating these basic principles. When we do not teach our children to voice their opinion and listen carefully with attention to what they have to say, we fail in teaching them to be good audience and good listeners and good communicators. And that's what we inherit as adults who have not been, most of us unfortunately, trained in an Islamic way, in a Muslim context, in a family, we grow up to be stubborn, selfish, and individualistic, both in our thoughts, in our ideas, and in the way we want to implement them. So we end up creating the struggle, whether the context is a family or a community. And this is why tyranny is the opposite of shura. Tyranny means what Fir'aun used to say, ma urikum illa ma ara. I am only telling you what I see. Wa ma ahdikum illa sabil al-rashad. I only guide you to the best ways. How could Pharaoh be guiding his community to the best ways when he has enslaved his own community? turn them into slaves and servants. But this is tyranny in its epic, and it is the clear opposite and contrast with mercy, forgiveness, and mutual consultation. So the principle of shura, while Muslim scholars do have two positions regarding whether or not the result of the shura is binding to the leader or not, a shura mulzima or mu'lima, the vast majority of the life of the Prophet وسلم, he executed the result of the shura as is, except if there is a wahy to the contrary. I want to repeat this. The Prophet وسلم, as a leader to his community, but also as a prophet, never violated the shura unless it was a matter of wahi. 
We all remember the example in the Battle of Badr when the Prophet ﷺ camped the army in a place and one of the young companions who has experience with warfare and combat came to the Prophet ﷺ because he didn't like where the camp was set. And he asked him, Prophet Muhammad, is this place chosen based on inspiration from Allah, guidance from Allah, revelation, or is it a matter open for opinion and consultation? He said, no, it's a matter of opinion. The young man never hesitated. He said, فَإِنَّ هَذَا لَيْسَ بِمَنْزِلٍ This is not a good place to camp. You look at the vigor and the strength this young man talks to the Prophet after he made sure that the matter is open for consultation. It's not a matter of wah. It's not revelation. It's not divine inspiration. So he says, this is not a good place to camp. Let us move and camp next to the well of Badr so that we have access to the water and the enemies don't have access. We want to circle the area around the well so that we have monopoly over the source of water. Their animals would not have water. Ours will do. And that is exactly what the Prophet ﷺ did. So you see, when it is a matter of personal opinion, the Prophet ﷺ did not use his privileged access to revelation to tell the young man, young man, you don't know, I am the Prophet. That is not the attitude of the Prophet. But we have some leaders in our Muslim nations and some Muslim communities who speak that language as if they receive revelation. Their opinion cannot be changed, cannot be challenged. And there is no open way for other suggestions that is contrary to the governance principle of shura that the Prophet ﷺ followed. On the other hand, we explained before in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, when the Muslims came from Mecca to make Umrah, and they were from Medina to make Umrah in Mecca, they were stopped at the outskirts of Mecca by the pagans. They didn't want them in. And the Prophet ﷺ signed an agreement that we explained before. It was not in favor of the Muslims. In fact, it was in favor of the disbelievers. And it disfavored Muslims, asking the Muslims if a non-Muslim joins the Muslim community and converts to Islam, they should send him back to the disbelievers. But the opposite is not true. So the companions were very upset. But because this was a matter of divine guidance, the Prophet ﷺ executed his decision to sign the agreement despite all of the opposition. And the opposition, by the way, did not come from this time young, fresh companions. It came from top leaders like Umar ibn Khattab and others who were outspoken. And they asked the Prophet, why do we accept such a humiliating treaty? And the Prophet ﷺ says, I am the messenger of Allah. Allah will never let me down. He executed the divine guidance despite the opposition and despite the shura that was telling him, this is not a good treaty for us. But Allah described it as a good treaty. He says, Inna fatahna laka fathan mubina. That was the great preamble of the conquest of Mecca. So when it was divine instruction from Allah, the Prophet did not pay much attention to the shura. But I want just to uh, highlight the issue that he did not ignore it completely either. He answered the companions as they asked. And he was humble enough to listen to their criticism, which he himself knew that this doesn't look fair on the surface, 
but does it look good? Allah says it does, the Prophet complies. So he communicated with them, he accepted to listen to their criticism, but he gave them a simple, straightforward answers as if their questions were purely innocent. One of the questions Omar raised, عرضه, he said, aren't you the messenger of Allah? Awalasta Rasul Allah? And the Prophet وسلم, very humbly and very simply says, yes, I am. As if Omar is a passerby. Omar was a, one of the strongest ardent supporters of the Prophet وسلم, But the Prophet dealt with the object of the question, not the subject asking the question. He did not turn the question into a personal uh, attack or conflict with Omar. He took the substance of the question, answered it as an objective answer can be. Then he asked them, aren't we the believers? Do you think that we can fail you? Do you think you could not trust us to defend you and defend each other? And the Prophet وسلم, again gives a very simple, very straightforward, objective answer. Of course, you are the believers. Then he asked the third question, why do we then accept this? Let us fight it out. But the Prophet وسلم, was told by Allah, by way of uh, inspiration, that this is going to be good for them. And that's exactly the difference between a leader like the Prophet and any other leader. Allah told the Prophet وسلم, to tell us and to tell the companions, Innama ana basharun mithlukum. I am no more than a human being like you. You ilay. The only difference is I get revelation. That's the only difference. So this statement of that definition of how similar or different the Prophet وسلم, is from everyone else is the dividing line between how the Shura process should go. So for those who believe that they can hear anybody say anything and ignore what they say and go with their opinion, they need to listen. They need to understand that the Prophet وسلم, even with inspiration, he was able to communicate nicely, mercifully, and objectively with the critique that came to him to what he is planning to do. So this is one of those principles that if you govern, you govern based on consultation with those who are governed. And that's why the second principle, which is the first principle of governance, comes in. That principle is bay'ah, or the consent of the community to pledge support and to pledge obedience to the chosen leader. The consent of the governed is essential for the governor and the ruler to be able to lead the community. If you don't give the leader your commitment and pledge of obedience and following through, then the cliche says, if you don't have followers, you are no leader. If nobody listens to you, if nobody follows what you're saying, you are no leader. So the Prophet وسلم, understanding this principle, he accepted the pledge, the pledge of Islam and the pledge of defense from the companions of the Prophet. And they used to come and give this pledge individually, each one of them, to the Prophet وسلم, in person. Some of the Bedouin tribes who lived away from Medina but accepted Islam, they would send their representative leaders to give their pledge to the Prophet on their behalf in Medina. So they don't have all of them to travel to Medina to make the pledge. But the pledge was sent and reached the Prophet ﷺ. What does the pledge mean? The pledge in Arabic is called bay'ah. What does it include? 
Bay'ah could be varieties of things. There is Bay'ah al-Islam, or the pledge of Islam. When somebody comes new, fresh, then he gives the Prophet ﷺ the pledge of commitment to Allah, to the Qur'an, to his messenger, and to the community in general. But the, the other type of pledge, was, which is a pledge of defense of Medina and the community in general, is a pledge in which people pledge to defend physically the Prophet ﷺ against any harm similar to their defense of their own children and wives. This is different from Bayat al-Islam, the pledge of being a Muslim. And they would defend the community as a whole whenever there is a call or a pend impending attack, everybody will either participate physically or chip in and participate financially. Some people were not able to participate physically. Uh, there are people, categories of people in the community, the sick, the limping, and the elderly, those who cannot really fight. They have no blame on them if they don't fight, provided that they offer what they can. They offer what they can of participation or contribution to the fight in defense of the community. So the concept of bay'ah is when a leader is to be chosen, it is like election of today, then in Islam there is the initial, uh, you could say by today's uh, terminology, you could say the initial support should come from the leaders of the communities in the society. And it is called the representative uh, selection process, where they, the leaders of their community, would support the Khalifa or the chosen leader and in a way nominate him for the rest of the community. As they nominate him, they give him the pledge of their own support then their followers and the rest of the society, the rest of the community would pledge the same thing. So when the Prophet ﷺ died, Abu Bakr and Umar went to Saqif uh, Bani Sa'idah and uh, they were a, a camp place in, uh, in Medina or a small neighborhood in Medina and they found that the communities are meeting, Al-Aws, Al-Khazraq, Al-Ansar, some of the Muhajireen, everybody's meeting. And everybody's trying to nominate someone from them. Them, them, them. And Umar ibn Khattab, Abu Bakr started the initiative and he said to Umar ibn Khattab, extend your hand so that I can give you the pledge. In other words, by today's terms, he wanted to nominate Umar to lead. And Umar al-Khattab said, that is impossible. The Prophet put you forth to lead us in prayer and other things. How could I lead you? You extend your hand, I give you the pledge. And Umar al-Khattab gave the Abu Bakr the pledge of commitment and obedience and the commitment to his leadership. And then the rest of the companions followed through. These were the leaders of the Ansar and the Muhajireen. And this is how the seerah gives us how Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu became the Khalifa. So the bay'ah is an essential part because it shows the commitment of the followers or the community to support whatever decisions the leadership makes. And the leadership commits to take consultation and opinions and factor those consultations and opinions in their decision, at least from the leaders of the communities in the society. So those are some of the basic, basic foundations and principles of governance in Islam, that the governed ought to commit and pledge and oblige voluntarily what does this say to what is actually going on today in the Muslim world? 
is to disclose and uncover the fact that we are led by no less and no more than tyranny. Everybody comes to power by force. Either you have the sword or you have the tank and take over. How could it be that you take over by force and display this force to tell people after I kill thousands of you, I'm going to run election. Who's going to say no? Especially if you unleash the Armageddon of media cohorts and magicians and deceitful people to create fear in the community that if you don't support this tyrant, then the nation will be in chaos. That is not Shura, that is not election, that is not bay'a, that is not commitment, that is no contract between the ruled and the ruler. They are just doing it because they are too scared to say no after all of the bloodshed that comes after all military takeovers anywhere. That is true in our Muslim nations as it is true in other nations also. Uh, Yugoslavia was ruled by a tyranny for years, decades. The Soviet Union, the same. Uh, uh, so we have to be careful that we do not use parts of Islam conveniently when we want and ignore the basics because we are afraid to face the fact. In other words, when somebody comes today after a military coup and then says to the community, don't you owe your leader the obedience and commitment? Doesn't Islam say you have to listen? Yeah, but the leader I choose, not the leader who uses me as a slave and he is Pharaoh and the master. That is not Islam. All contracts in Islam are only good so long as there is that principal element of mutual acceptance. Mutual acceptance is the promise and pledge of the governor to lead according to the guidance of Islam, to follow where the best interest of the society is, not the best interest of his family or his supporters, but the society. Whether this society includes other than Muslims or not, if you live in Medina, and we explained last time that whether you are a Jew, a Christian, a Bedouin, pagan, you have the same rights like every Muslim who lives in Medina. But you also have the same obligations. That is equality and that's a, a principle of governance. You can't govern based on racism. You can't govern based on ethnic division of the community or religious division in the community. You can only govern according to Islam by being fair, not favoritist. To be fair to everyone and to give equal opportunity to everybody, not to favor your followers and alienate and kick out of your consideration all else who don't agree with your policy or the way you took over or the governing style that you're following. So if you look at these principles and measure any Muslim nation today, you will easily reach the rational conclusion. There is a lot of things to fix in our societies to make them Muslim societies. And it is not, by the way, the first step of reform. It is not the top of the pyramid. Unfortunately, leadership filters up. So if we start by being individuals and families who practice shura in our life, who practice fairness in our life, who love justice 
and decency and respect for others in our personal, family, social, and community lives, then the likelihood of us filtering up good leaders that represent the values from which they grow up, then we are likely to get Muslim leaders. But so long as we are not practicing any of that, we will always filter pharaohs and tyrants and despots. So we get them because we secrete them out and up. This is the product of the society. And this is why it is said, كَمَا تَكُونُونَ يُوَلَّ عَلَيْكُمْ Whoever governs you is going to come from within your society. And however your society operates, that also will filter up into the upper echelon of your leadership. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to follow Allah and to follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ولانا محمد عبد ورسول وبعد We do have a problem that I want to consult with you in a way present to you We have cruel men who would kick their wives out of their homes against the instructions of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ because either they don't like them or because they divorce them. The Quran says, لا تخرجوهن من بيوتهن Don't kick your wives out of their homes. The Quran calls a home, the woman is home. مِنْ بُيُوتِهِنَّ وَلَا يَخْرُجْنَ Nor should they get out of the home. And this is in Surah Al-Talaq. So the, the context is divorce. This is not a peace time. This is war time. Don't kick her out. But some cruel people, they kick a woman out even in this society, which is not a Muslim society. And as a result, some of those women, they end up in shelters. So after trying to manage this problem for years, handling individual cases, putting somebody in a hotel for a week or a few days and so on and so forth, we found it much more rational in using your resources that we partner with some organization that cares on this issue to buy a shelter. And ICNA, the Islamic Circle of North America, became our partner in this project. And tomorrow, there is a fundraising dinner to buy a place in Virginia so that we can have a shelter that accommodates these cases. Women who are divorced, women with children who are widows, they lost their husband to death, uh, people who, whose income went below poverty line to the point that there is no way, there is no immediate help. Yes, the government can help, but it takes time for the government help to come forward. So at the meantime, these people need shelters. Children need protection. So I urge you to ask the office for details. The fundraising dinner will be done at Dunya restaurant on uh, Stevens Road, which is uh, in Alexandria, Virginia. You can get the information from the office. And it is at 6 o'clock. And your contribution, your participation, will show how much we care as a community of mercy and compassion. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt. Wa aafina fi man aafayt. Wa tawallana fi man tawallayt. Wa qina wa asrif anna sharra ma qadayt. اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك 
ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا اللهم متعنا بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين ولا مبدلين ولا مغيرين اللهم لا تدع لنا في يومنا هذا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا مهموما إلا فرجت همه ولا مدينا إلا قضيت دينه ولا حاجة من حوائج الدنيا والآخرة لك فيها رضا ولنا فيها صلاح وفلاح إلا قضيتها اللهم اشف مرضانا ومرضى المسلمين وارحم موتانا وموت المسلمين اللهم قو علماءنا اللهم قو علماءنا اللهم ثبت علماءنا على الحق اللهم ثبت علماءنا على الحق وأقمنا جميعا على الحق والعدل واختم لنا بخاتمة السعادة أجمعين مع النبيين والصدقين والشهداء والصالحين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة